Anyway, welcome everyone. It had to be you. I, that title just came into my mind because that's the title really of the sermon today. It had to be you. And really, the Lord has you specifically chosen for a special work on earth as it is in heaven. Do you believe that? And it has to be you. It has to be you. Because you are so unique and special to him. Wonderfully and fearfully made in your mother's womb you were. And when we think about this, we remember two weeks ago when Dan shared in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, where the word says that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. If you have that first, I'm jumping right into it, by the way. We're going to pray in a second, but just kind of introducing this. But we are his workmanship. Remember, taken after the word poetry, a poet. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for with good works prepared in advance for us to walk in. We are his workmanship. In Acts chapter 17, when Paul was going through Athens and he was walking around seeing all these statues and finally he was sharing with the Athenians who the God that they were searching for was, he said that everyone has been placed on earth, this earth at special times and seasons and boundary lines so that they would seek, grope, and find the Lord. And so we are here for this season, for this purpose, because you know why? You are the right person for the right time and place to say and do the right things for the right purpose. You're the right person. The Lord has chosen the right person. You are made for this special purpose. And you were designed with destiny in mind. You were designed with his destiny in mind. You were designed for that. And you were cut out for all the challenges of this life. You were cut out for it because you are the right person. It had to be you. It has to be you. If it's not you, then who? He has chosen you for this time and season. So let's pray and invite the Lord to really in his spirit, use his word to do a mighty work in our hearts and minds. So, Lord God, we lift up this morning to you. And we thank you for just the laughter and the joy and the silliness of these songs, Lord God, because they, they just loosen us up and open us up because, Lord God, life with you is supposed to be joyful. It's supposed to be uh, filled with adventure. And as we're going to learn today, also will be set with challenges and suffering from time to time. But in the end, Lord God, we rejoice in the glory set before us. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You guys like Frank Sinatra? I kind of like hearing that old stuff. No? Some of you? A couple of you? It's, it's, it's cool. It just kind of puts you in a certain kind of, I don't know, nostalgic mood in a sense. But as we dig into this into this chapter. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 to 13. And the reason why this, this title came to mind is as, you know, we continue to read about Paul writing to the Ephesians who are Gentiles, okay? And we talked about that. They're non-Jewish people. Paul's whole mission for his life was really designed to, to bring the Gentiles into Christ because the Gentiles were considered unclean people and yet Paul's whole mission statement was to draw in the Gentiles and tell them yes they are also included into the kingdom of God that was his purpose and it had to be Paul just like it has to be you for your special purpose because Paul had to unlock the mystery we're going to see the mystery said three times here he had to unlock the mysteries set before the Gentiles that now they are no longer hidden from the face of God. They are welcomed in. So you ready? We're going to dig right in to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, 
for you Gentiles. Now let's just stop there a second. We're not going to stop every verse, but let's stop there. For this reason, I, Paul, for this reason, do you know there's always a reason for every season of your life, right? There's a reason. There's a reason that you went through what you have, the journey in getting to where you are in life today. There's a reason for it. There is a reason you're in the current set of circumstances in your life. There's a reason for it. And there's a reason for where God is leading you to. There's a reason. There's a purpose. There's a purpose for your journey here. There's a purpose for why you're here. And there's a purpose for where you're going. There's a purpose that God has for your life. And Paul realized many, many years ago, there's a purpose. There's a reason that I am a prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. There's a reason for it. There's a reason for every season that you're in in your life. Amen? And so Paul realized that he was a prisoner. But notice what he says. The prisoner of who? Of the Romans? Now, you know, Paul was literally writing from prison in Rome. He was a prisoner of Rome. But is he saying, I, a prisoner of the Romans, or I, the prisoner of Jesus Christ? Christ. You know, whatever prison you think you're in at this time, or whatever situation you find yourself, you are always under the jurisdiction of Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? No matter what you think you're in, good or bad, you're always under the jurisdiction of Jesus Christ. You're un always in him. No matter where you find yourself, you are in Christ. So Paul realized, look, if the Lord wants to set me free from this prison in Rome, he will. But it's for this purpose I'm here because people are getting saved here in Rome. Even in Caesar's home, people are getting saved. There's a reason I'm here, and it's not because I'm a prisoner of Rome. It's because I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I'm a bondservant of Jesus Christ. No matter where you find yourself, you are always under the jurisdiction of of Jesus Christ. I was reading about uh, Julian Assange. Remember who he was? He was the author of WikiLeaks, and uh, he spread all this, uh, the things around that caused uh, the U.S. and other governments a lot of problems because he revealed things and so forth. But he found himself, like, about to get arrested for many things, so he ran to the Ecuadorian uh, embassy in, in England and stayed there for a while, and finally they caught up to him and they extradited him into prison, and there he sits now in prison. But he, he was finally, he was imprisoned, but he was, he was held at some time. He was in a sanctuary of the Ecuadorian embassy. Well, you know, we are always in the embassy of Jesus Christ. We are always insulated and protected in Christ. No matter where we are, we are always in Christ. So Paul was well aware what his role in life was. Right from the beginning, do you remember in Acts chapter 21 when he, was, when he was, uh, went back to Jerusalem for the final time and he told the church of Ephesus, he told the elders that I will never see you again because when I go to Jerusalem, they're going to capture me. But the Lord has told me that I will go to Rome someday. So I'm going this last time, but I won't see you again. And when he went to Jerusalem, and he, he entered the temple. You, if you recall the story, you know, the James and Peter and the others said, listen, you know, all they keep hearing about you is that you are inviting the Gentiles into the kingdom of God, and you're telling them they don't have, they don't have to follow the law of Moses, and everyone in this town really is mad at you. And so please just pretend you're following all the law. Shave your head, do these things, make it look like you're under a vow and a Nazarite, and, you know, so that you don't get yourself at us in trouble. So Paul said, okay, whatever. I'll do whatever you need me to do. So he shaved his head, he went in and paid the, the temple tax and all this stuff. And what happened? At the end of it all, they went into the temple and they dragged him out of the temple. I think we have the picture of that verse there crying out, men of Israel, help. This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, and this place. And furthermore, he also brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place, which he didn't actually bring his friends into the temple, but he did have Greeks with him because they were his friends, the Gentiles, right? 
And all the city was disturbed, and the people ran together, seized Paul, and dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. He was arrested on behalf of the Gentiles. But this was nothing new to Paul. He always knew this was his destiny. If you can recall, remember when he was heading to Damascus, and and the Lord struck him down, and he was struck with blindness, and he said, why are you persecuting me? Well, who are you? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And he was struck with blindness, and he went to Damascus. And as he was there for three days, finally the Lord sent Ananias there and said, listen, I want you to go there, and I want you to pray over him so that he receives sight. And Ananias said to the Lord, uh, well, I'm paraphrasing, are you crazy? Uh, This is the guy who is killing people like me. I do not, you know, are you... I'm paraphrasing. Are you sure, God? He goes, no, go. And we have that next verse in Acts chapter 9 because he said, I will show him. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the who? The Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. So Paul knew right from the beginning, this is my calling in life. Well, you might say, Paul, like how did you continue on if you knew this was your lot in life? Because the joy set before him was well worth anything the Lord was going to bring him through. You know, all of us at, from time to time will suffer on behalf of Christ, won't we? At times you're going to find yourself in a situation and say, well, how is this suffering for Christ? How am I actually suffering on behalf of Christ? Well, you're suffering. The question is, will Christ rise up in you? Will you you enable the Lord to rise up in the midst of your suffering and reveal something true about himself? Because a lot of times when we feel that we're, we're suffering, we think something's happening to us instead of something happening for Christ. We need to use the opportunity in suffering to exalt Christ, to glorify Christ, because those are the perfect moments. Why waste a good suffering? Okay? If you're suffering, you might as well glorify Christ in it and say, all right, if this is what's happening, guess what's going to happen now? Christ is going to rise up in the midst of my suffering. He will be exalted in the midst of the suffering I'm going through. Something good is going to be coming out of this, you know? We're going to make lemonade out of these lemons, right? Something awesome is about to happen. And that's what, the, the, that's what Paul wanted the Gentiles to know. In fact, we have here in uh, Peter, if you could put, uh, I'm sorry, Paul wrote to the Philippians, and he told them about suffering. For to you, it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. You know, all of us are called to some suffering. If you're not suffering at all, you might not be in the right spot. Because at some point, you're supposed to undergo, undergo some suffering because that's where God is glorified, isn't he? He's glorified in the midst of suffering in life. We don't like suffering, but we can rejoice in it because we know something awesome is about to happen in it. And that's why... Paul also wrote to the Colossians. I mentioned this verse last week, but it always strikes me so profound because Paul said this, I rejoice now in my suffering for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. You know, Christ didn't suffer in the same way Paul suffered. To our knowledge, he wasn't shipwrecked. To our knowledge, he wasn't stoned, probably to death. To our knowledge, you know, a lot of things didn't happen to Christ that happened to Paul. But Paul said, I am am fulfilling what was lacking in Christ's suffering. In other words, I am showing Christ in the midst of this suffering. God will be glorified in the midst of it. In the same way, you maybe have gone through a divorce and say, you know, Christ never had to suffer through a broken family, through a divorce, the pain and the betrayal. Well, he is now. He is now. If you're going through it, Christ is going through it. He is going through it in you. 
And Christ can be glorified in the midst of whatever situation you're in. Christ is going through it. You are fulfilling what was lacking in the afflictions of Christ by living through this and glorifying Christ in the midst of suffering. It has to be you. It had to be you. It had to be you because guess what? There's no one else in that exact situation except for you. So if not you, then who? You're in the spot to glorify Christ in the midst of whatever it is you're going through. I don't know if all of you saw the, the WhatsApp uh, about Paul Ladenslager Jr. And uh, last Thursday evening, he died in a car accident. And if you know Paul Sr. and Eileen, they, they're a part of our church family. You'll see Paul. He's always busy, the most humble guy you'll ever see. He's just running around, just doing whatever needs to be done. He's either on security or he's, or he's moving things around and, and take, putting things away and so forth. The most humble guy, and Eileen, his wife, works in the nursery, and she also works on the security team. And they're just, we just love them so much. And uh, I got a text yesterday about his son. And, uh, but the, the great news is he's home with the Lord. He's a believer. Paul is a believer, and he's with Christ now. And we, I per, we personally know Paul because he used to attend our church very early on, probably four years ago, until he met Rachel and they got married, they started a family, and, uh, and so he leaves behind a, a wife and four children, so please pray for them, the Laudenslagers family, and uh, because, uh, you know, they, they really covet your prayers, they, they love this church so much, and uh, Jill and I saw them yesterday, and they're doing amazingly well. I mean, they are so strong right now in this. And, and just praying with Paul, I just reminded him, and he, 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 he appreciated the reminder that, you know, in the midst of this miserable time and this sorrow, Paul, Paul is representing Christ in the midst of his family. He's the patriarch of that family. And Paul has the opportunity to say, okay, now what is my role in here? I have a key role in the midst of this suffering that we're all going through. I'm going to make it good for God. I'm going to glorify God in the midst of this. And you know what, how when you rise up to that occasion, there's something so healing about that. I can't even explain it. But when you realize, wait, this isn't happening to me. It's happening for me. It's happening for others. It's happening for God. I'm not a victim here. God is a victor. He will have victory in the midst of suffering. And when you suddenly say, no, I'm here for a reason, for a purpose, and I hate it, but guess who's going to win? God's going to win in the midst of this, and I am going to rise up and represent Christ in the middle of this anxiety and this stress. And it's, there's something immediately healing to your heart. I can't explain it. But it's suddenly you're connected to your eternal purpose. And the circumstances down here are so temporary. So we're going to get over it so quickly. But when I'm finally with Christ in heaven, I'm going to look back and say, I thank you, Lord, for giving me the proper perspective of what I was going through. Because I kept my eyes on you the whole time. Not on what I was going through, but I kept my eyes on you, the author and perfecter of my faith. And in that, you prevailed. In the midst of that misery, you prevailed. And there's something amazingly healing about that, you know? It, it's, you know, just to, I shared it before, but just real quick. When my mom passed away several Christmases ago, and this church was really young, and we were over there in Elms Terrace in Lansdale. We were just praying and, and thanking the Lord for mom. And she was, her body was still there. And, and I'll admit, I said, Lord, if you're willing, mom, rise up. <laughs> I literally prayed that she would sit up. But I knew it was her time to go home. And I, in fact, I was just thinking, Lord, how much longer can she endure this body of flesh, you know? But from there, we had to go right across the street to our church we now own, to serve people on Christmas morning breakfast. And I said, you know, it's right across the street, but are we going to go? Of 
course, of course we're going to go. Because guess who's going to win in this? Jesus is going to prevail. He is going to win. This will be a day we will never forget. In the midst of misery, something amazing is about to happen. Meanwhile, we already know that mom is so happy with Jesus right now in heaven. We don't have to worry about her. So why be so sad? Why not move on to the next joyful thing God has for us? And we went right across the street into that, into that fellowship hall where we're doing the hoedown. Okay, I love the way the Lord just keeps connecting everything, you know. Right into the hoedown and looking around, seeing all our brothers and sisters in this church and the love, the love we just received by everyone and all of these people coming in, the homeless, the, the least of these walking in and getting fed and getting served the word of God and the beautiful music. And I'm just thinking, there couldn't have been a better day than this. Mom's home with the Lord. These homeless are now finding a home in Christ. It's all good. It's all good. You know, we need to just find the beauty in the moment, even in suffering. There's something to rejoice about. There really is. And if the Lord has called you to some suffering today, I'm telling you, it's for a purpose. It's not an accident. He has designed you to be in that place to play a key role in that moment to, to unlock the mystery of God's grace in that moment. You are the key. You are the key. So we better read on. But man, isn't God good? Are you just feeling his spirit here today? I just, is he's talking to me right now? Is he talking to you? I mean, he's beautiful. Isn't he beautiful? He's just reaching into our hearts right now and saying, I know exactly where you're at. I know exactly where you, and I'm there with you too. Amen. But let's, let's dig in. So verse 2. If indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, the grace given to me for you, the charisma. That's the word, charisma. You know, we're a charismatic church. Some of you might say, you are? I heard that's something crazy and wild. Charisma is gifts. We believe in all the gifts of the Spirit. That's charisma. We all have charisma. I bet you didn't know that about it. You have charisma. You have the charismatic nature of Christ. He is a giver. He is the father of lights, the giver of every good and perfect gift. He's a giver. And if he's a giver, you're a giver. All those gifts you're carrying around, you could just keep giving them away to other people. The gifts of, of healing, of prayer, of wisdom, of knowledge, all those things he's given you, just keep giving it away. You never, un you never can outspend God. He's always pouring into you more and more gifts. But Paul is saying, you know, the grace I've been given, the charisma, I will give to you. I think we have a verse, if we have time, for 1 Peter 4.10 that we see here that as each one of us has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of of God. What gift do I have? There's a variety of gifts. It's a manifold grace. It's unlimited. It has so many different... God is complex, yet he makes himself simple for us. But the gifts you have are so unique sometimes that no one else could offer that gift at that moment than you, because you have a key role in every moment. It has to be you, right? It has to be you. You are the one in that moment of time that can dispense the grace of God to that situation. So let's continue, and we really are going to get through this. We're going to speed up now. You ready? How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read or when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles, this is the mystery, you ready? That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God, here it goes again, given to me by the effective working of his power. So he's saying the mystery, his purpose 
is to reveal the mystery that Gentiles are now allowed in. Because, you know, before that, Gentiles were not the people of God Almighty, the creator of the universe, because they worshiped other gods. Unless they converted to Judaism, they were not a worshiper of the one true God. He's now saying, look, Jews and Gentiles now all have to be reconciled through Jesus Christ because we're all the same in Christ. Amen? And so let's continue on. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles. I just want to mention, you know, Paul, the reason he said the least of all the saints is because he persecuted the church of God. You know, I don't believe that Paul always thought of himself as a continual, he wasn't guilty of perpetual sin in his life. Instead, he was realizing that without Christ, I was nothing, nothing, and still am nothing without the Spirit of God in me. I am nothing. The only thing you or I have good in us is Christ came into us and saved us and lives in us. Now, we don't have to think about, well, what would I be without him? You don't have to worry because he's now one with you. He's woven in every cell of your spirit. He can't be released. He's in you. You are sealed to the day of your redemption. The Spirit's been given you, to you as a guarantee. You are one with Christ. Last week, remember, we talked all about being one with Christ. And so, as we read on, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see what is the fellowship, there it is again, of the mystery. A mystery means something hidden or secret. In fact, what's hidden shouldn't be hidden. In fact, the Lord says, you know, what I've whispered to you in the secret places, stand up on the rooftop and proclaim. Don't keep me a secret anymore. You know, it's funny, when Jesus was on the earth, he would heal someone or tell them something about himself and say, don't tell anybody. And what would they do? They'd run and tell everyone. Now he says, don't keep it a secret to us. And what do we do? We keep it a secret. You know, it's like, you know, he said, look, open up, unlock the mystery. Open up the mystery of me to others because I don't want to be a hidden God. I want to be a God that everybody knows. I am calling all men to myself. I want none to perish. And he's saying to you and I, you are the key to me opening up the mystery to everyone. You're my key. Don't keep it a secret. Don't keep it a mystery. Don't keep it hidden any longer. Unlock the doors. You're my key to getting into other people's lives. He has designed us for that purpose. If not you, then who? It has to be you. Amen? And so we're going to finish up. Verse, what verse are we on here? Anyway, so through Jesus Christ to the intent, verse 10, that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. We're going to get more into these principalities and powers when we get to Ephesians 6, so we're going to move forward. And verse 11, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. So remember, he's writing, he's writing to the Ephesians, the very ones that he met with before he went back to Jerusalem. And he said, I will never see you any longer. This is the last time I will see you. And remember, they were crying, and they just didn't want to hear that because they loved Paul. He brought so much revelation to them, so much love to them. He introduced them to the love of Jesus Christ and said, you are a part of the kingdom of God. I mean, he unlocked the mystery to them, that they now can know the mysterious God is no longer hidden from them, that they can in fact know him 
to. He unlocked that mystery. And now here he is in prison writing to them, saying, don't get upset that I'm here in prison. Don't get upset you'll never see me face to face again. Because it is for your and God's glory. It's all worth it to me. I already have my joy because I know you are walking and following with Jesus. You are right with Jesus. And that's all that matters to me. Don't get upset by what I am undergoing, the pressure in prison. Because it's all worth it to me. And you know, it had to be Paul, didn't it? It had to be Paul to unlock the mystery because he was the very one who was persecuting the Jews who were introducing others to Jesus and saying, you don't have to follow any of these laws anymore. It's really Jesus. The Son of God has already come. And so Paul was the one chosen. I believe all of us are chosen, are chosen for a special purpose, for a special purpose to unlock the mystery of God to others. I really do. Remember when Jesus was walking through Caesarea Philippi with the disciples, and he was saying, you know, who do people say that I am? And they say, well, some say you are uh, Elijah or John the Baptist come back to life or some prophet Jeremiah or one of them. And then he said, who do you say that I am? And do you remember Peter spoke up and he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And you remember, in fact, we have Matthew 16. And then Jesus said to Peter, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I will give you the keys. You know, he wasn't just speaking. That was, a, that was the beginning of something. That was the beginning. Telling Peter, you are the beginning. You are the rock on which I will build my church. But really, hasn't he given all of us keys? to unlock the mysteries of God. In fact, I believe you and I are like a key for God. I was thinking about this. I have keys up here. And I was thinking, how does our life relate to a key? And if you look at a key, okay, you don't have to pull one out unless you want to. It might make a lot of rattling. But if you have a key, you look at, and it has a lot of, it has ridges, right, which is the points, and it has plateaus, which is the flat part, and then it goes down into the dip, and those are called notches on a key. But you think about your life, right? And don't we all have a lot of highs and lows in life? If you look at the, the, the line of a key, and you say, you know, I can remember times that I was a notch, really low, some really low times in my life. I can remember that. And I can remember other times in my life that I felt so good about everything, so good about myself, so good about whatever. And those were the mountaintop experiences, so I thought at times. I've learned sometimes they weren't. But those were the ridges, the, the, the peaks of my life, the valleys and the peaks of life. And yet I believe that the Lord, he uses that timeline and those seasons of our life as a key to other people's lives. I have here a key. It's actually a lock from a storage locker. And you know, as, as this key goes into that cylinder, every single thing that we went through is for a purpose. The ups and downs of life are for a purpose, aren't they? And it's for, to reach others in that same situation so we can relate to them and why? Unlock the mysteries unlock the mysteries of Jesus to them. Because to, to them, God could be hidden and they don't know Jesus and the love of Jesus and the, and the purpose on why they're going through this. They don't understand it, but we do. And we've gone through it or are going through it. Why? So that we can 
unlock the mystery of Jesus to them. I have here a graphic of an inside of a lock. I know I really got into this maybe too much, but just work with me here, okay? But it's really cool because a lock, you ever think about like how, you know, how does this thing unlock and lock and everything? But some of you people are saying, duh, don't you know this? But it's really cool when you think about it in terms of what we're talking about because inside a lock, there's something called tumblers. And that's that spring that's attached to a pin. They're called tumbler pins, right? And there's pressure. And as that key goes into the lock, okay, it has to line right up with the tumbler pins, okay? Because if it doesn't, it won't be lined up enough so that you could turn the cylinder, okay? And so when that key goes in with all the ridges and notches and lines perfectly up with the tumbler pins, it can turn. Now, I believe all of us have gone through what we've gone through, the peaks and valleys, the ridges and the notches in our life, so that we could fit right in to the situation God has placed us into, so that we can turn the tables on the enemy. Because the enemy wants to suppress people. That's what those tumbler pins are. It's just pressure. It's just pressure. You get pressure when you're on your highs, and you get pressures when you're on your low. They're the tumbler pins in life. And it's applying pressure. But guess what? When the key goes in there and fits just right, it turns the cylinder. It turns the table. It turns things around on the enemy. And so the enemy thought, I'm applying enough pressure. No, no you're really not, because you weren't, you weren't fathoming me coming into the picture because the Lord has designed me for such a time as this to unlock the tumbler, hasn't he? And that's why he allows us to go through these things so we're the perfect key with all the ups and downs in life, all the ridges and knots so that we can fit right into the place and turn the table. And it's interesting because in in Acts chapter 2, when when the Spirit of God came and all the, the disciples were anointed by the Holy Spirit and they were baptized by the Holy Spirit and they're starting to speak out and praising. Suddenly the mockers came along. Oh, they're all drunk and so on. And no one knew what to make of it. And all of a sudden, Peter stood up among the 11 and he remembered, wait a minute, he's the Christ And I'm supposed to unlock the mysteries to my brethren. In fact, the Lord told me that's what my role is. I have the key. I have a key for this situation. And with that, he started preaching and preaching, if you follow Ephesians chapter 2. And it came to one certain spot that he finally said, the one whom you crucified is the Christ and the Lord. As soon as he said Christ, suddenly, bam! What must we do? What do I got to do? What do I got to do to be saved? Suddenly, an amazing door just swung open and truth poured out. The kingdom of God unleashed itself. And the gates of Hades couldn't even withstand because heaven was just opened up where it was meant to be because Peter knew he had keys because Jesus said, you have the keys and you're going to know when to use it. Do you realize that each one of us are a key? You know, you look at this ring of keys and half of them I can't even find the lock. In fact, I had to look for this lock all morning to find it, okay? But each key is meant for a different lock. We all look different. We're all going through different things, different peaks, different valleys. One key isn't going to go into the same lock as the other. Each key is meant for a different lock. And your life is meant to fit into a different cylinder, a different situation for a different purpose. But in the end, it's all to glorify Christ. Every peak, every value of your life is is just like a key ridge meant to fit right into a lock, to open up the mystery of God. Amen? That's what you are, a key to unlock the mystery of Jesus Christ. 
to whatever cylinder you find yourself in, whatever sphere of influence, whatever situation. When I was thinking about this idea of being in a situation, and it reminded me of of what do we need to do in every environment? You find yourself, in a sense, in a cylinder, right? What do we got to remember? I think the first thing we got to ask ourselves is, why am I here? Why am I here? Why am I here? And what must I do? Do you remember when Elijah called down fire from heaven? I won't get into the whole story, but he called down fire from heaven, proving God is the only God. And then he said, capture the 450 prophets of Baal and and execute them. And with that, the rain came. He prayed seven times. The rain came. And then Ahab ran away and went back and told Jezebel all about what Elijah just did. And Elijah made it back, ran, and caught up and went in. And he had heard, he had heard about what Jezebel was saying. And Jezebel was saying, the same thing that he did to those prophets are going to happen to him. And what's interesting, by the way, is the word says in 1 Kings 19 that when Elijah saw that, what did he see? He didn't see anything. He heard it. But the word says when he saw it. In other words, when he envisioned what Jezebel was saying about him, he became extremely fearful. You know, I believe that when we put worry into visionary form and start to envision all these bad things happening, we will be gripped with fear. We will be gripped with all kinds of unbelief because we are envisioning what the enemy is saying. But in reality, Elijah should have known, wait a minute. I mean, I just stood against 450 prophets of Baal, against King Ahab, who wanted to kill me for the last three and a half years. I, I, you know, this is really, why am I afraid of this woman? But he suddenly was gripped with fear. But that's really not the point. I just always, it sparked out at me. But, so then he ran, remember, for 40 days and nights out to see God. And when he went into the cave to see God, and God said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now, God knew what he was doing there, right? I mean, he, he gave an angel, told an angel to feed and refresh him with water twice in order for him to make the 40-day trip out to him into the cave. But he said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And then with that, he says, go out of the cave. And he didn't go out of the cave, he waited. And then the, remember the, the wind, the earthquake, the fire came, and then finally a small, still small voice, and Elijah went out. Elijah, what are you, what are you doing here? And I believe all of us have to ask ourselves because God knew why he was there. And then, of course, for the second time, Elijah says, I've been zealous for the Lord and because they aren't obeying your commandments and they are tearing down your altars and they are killing your prophets and I'm the only one left. And he wasn't. But he said twice, what are you doing here? And in the same way, I think all of us just say, why am I in the situation I'm in? Because there's a reason There's a reason you're there. And we need to ask ourselves, what am I doing here? Because I know something profound and amazing is going to happen in the midst of it. Because I'm a key. I have a key role in this situation. And there's tumblers just weighing down on me. But I know no temptation has seized you, which is uncommon to man. And he will always provide an escape and allow you to stand up under the tumbler. No matter what the pressure is, you know, tribulation, the word for tribulation is pressure. Whatever tribulation you're going through, that pressure, it's just a tumbler pin. It's meant to be there. Why? So that when you turn the table on the enemy, suddenly the door is unlocked. And whammo, suddenly the mysteries of God are unleashed to everyone in that situation. The pressure's supposed to be there. You don't like it, neither do I. But if it's not there, a door won't be open to someone else who needs to be set free of something. The doors need to be open, don't they? The doors of truth to God have to be open. It's only a tumbler pin. 
It's not the enemy keeping you down. It's, it's the enemy applying pressure, the, the, just the right tribulation, so that when you turn things around on the enemy, that door is going to be opened up, and the truth of God will be revealed to everyone in that situation. And suddenly, God said, after he asked the second time, what are you doing here? He said, all right, let me tell you what to do. That's the second question we have to say, is what must I do next? Because God was actually giving him a recipe to heal his loneliness. Because Elijah was so lonely. I'm the only one left. No, you know there's 50 in this cave and 50 in that cave hiding. But you also know that there's other people who haven't bailed bailed to bail. And he said, there's 7,000 others. You just don't know them. You need to meet some people. He was revealing to Elijah how to even be set free of his loneliness. Go and find Elisha. And by the time Elijah went up to heaven, remember there were schools of prophets, they're outside, they're they're not afraid anymore. They're not afraid. Something great was about to happen, and that's exactly when Elijah was having a meltdown. When the best is yet to come, it's only a little pressure. It's a tumbler pin. It's meant to be there. And the Lord was saying, no, 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 no. This is the beginning of something great. Do you realize you're about to turn the table on the enemy? You're about to open up the door to Elisha, and he is going to unleash your truth about Jesus, about Yahweh, to all the prophets. And they're going to be prophesying, and there's going to be freedom, and the kings will actually once again be asking you for direction. Remember, that's what happened with Elisha. The king started asking Elisha, give me some help, tell me what to do. In the same way, you're in that situation for such a specific purpose. And what you think is the enemy keeping you down is actually a tumbler pin that is about to unlock that door to open up the mystery. The enemy doesn't realize he's doing you a favor. Because without that pressure, you wouldn't have turned the table. A lot of times I believe we need pressure from the enemy to act, to move. You know, it it took... It took the people mocking to, for Peter to finally say, no, 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 wait a minute. I know what's happening here. I just remembered. I have a key. I have a key, and you're a tumbler. And guess what's going to happen? I'm about to turn the table on this situation. Let me tell you what's really happening. In the same way, Elijah, no, 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 no. This is just a tumbler pin. We're about to turn the table. God, everyone in Israel will know the one true God. And suddenly, truth started to burst forth through Elisha and the other prophets. When you look at uh, Esther, and she was in Babylon after Judah was brought to Babylon in exile. And she was there, and she was very beautiful, and she was chosen by King Ahurus, Ahurus, or Ahurus, or whatever, how you ever pronounce his name. But anyway, he was ch- she was chosen as queen, And do you remember when a plot was unraveled against King Ahaz, Mordecai revealed it to Esther. And Esther told the king, look, these two eunuchs are planning to kill you. And so he hung them on the gallows. And then time went on, nothing was done for Mordecai. But Haman, a very evil guy, an Amalekite, as he would go along, and he was very prominent in the kingdom with King Ahaz, he would go around, and, and he wanted everyone to bow to him, but Mordecai wouldn't. So he's so angry, and he's like, you know, I, I got to do something about that Mordecai, okay? But then he said, wait a minute, he's a Jew. We don't like Jews. You know, the world doesn't like Jews right now. There's a lot of anti-Semitism. That's how you know there's a shifting of a spiritual realm, I believe, in this world. But great things are happening. Anyway, but so he says, you know what? Why don't I just put a law that we're going to kill the Jews? That'll get back at Mordecai. Let's wipe them all out. And so as he was designing this plan, and as you know, Mordecai heard about it, and he call, called for Queen Esther, which was his cousin, by the way, his uncle's daughter, and he said, listen, you know, there's a plot here against the Jews. And she said, well, I don't know if I can help you out. I'm paraphrasing. Uh, you know, if he, I can't even approach the king or else I'll be killed and all that. And Whoa, 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 whoa. You're a key. Why do you think you're in that cylinder? Why do you think? 
you know, perhaps you're in the kingdom as the queen for such a time as this. You're not in there just to, ha, 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 you know, I love all this praise and the parties and the drinking and, and all this. No, you're in there for a purpose. We're always in there for a purpose. We're always in there for a purpose, right? And he said, no, perhaps you're there for a purpose. Don't think you're going to escape this thing. But if he doesn't use you, he'll use another key. He's got the master key. He'll find someone else to unlock that door. But perhaps you're there. And then finally she said, you're right. I'm here for such a time as this. And she said, if I die, I die. Fast. And of course, you know what happened. The, the plot was revealed. But if there was no Haman, if there was no Haman, okay, Mordecai wouldn't have been exalted. Do you know when Haman was hung, Mordecai was made, put in Haman's position as second in charge. He was in charge. And guess what? They went around and they, the Jews went around and massacred all the people who were plotting against them. I know it sounds bloody right now, but it's symbolic of spiritual things, right? And because of, because of Haman, many people converted to Judaism because they saw these people rise up and they say, I want to be like them. I want to know this God. I want this kind of favor. How can they be in exile and, and actually be, be prosperous in the midst of exile? That's what happens when you turn the tables on the enemy and you go into a situation and say, wait a minute. No, I'm here for a reason. And what must I do? And you turn the tables. The doors are unlocked. As the worship team comes forward, we're going to close up. But there needs to be a Haman. There needs to be a tumbler pin in your life for you to finally say, wait a minute, I need to act. Because you know what happens when everything's perfect in life? You really don't see a purpose to turn the tables on the enemy because you're fine, you're good. Well, no, we need that tribulation at times to rise up and represent Christ because this world is broken. This world is sad. This world has a lot of misery. And if we don't know why we're here, we're losing the whole point. We can't be living for a comfortable lifestyle. We are the keys to the kingdom of God. He has placed them in our hands. And each one of us have a specific cylinder to be in and a specific door to unlock to the world so that they too would know Jesus Christ. If there was no Jezebel, Elijah would have never ran out to the cave. There needs to be a tumbler pin. There needs to be a Jezebel for Elijah to end up in that cave to, re, to receive his next assignment. I'm going to find you the perfect protege in Elijah. There needs to be a tumbler pin in your life. And I don't know who it might be, and hopefully it's not the person next to you. Don't glance over at them right now, okay? But it's really the enemy. He, he has applied pressure in your life. But the pressure is needed for you finally to rise up and say, no. It's not going to happen to me. In fact, it's happening for me. It's not a setback. It's a setup I once heard. I love that. A setup. That I will prevail in the midst of this. I will rise up beneath this tumbler pin, and I will turn the tables on the enemy, and this door will be unlocked, and the mysteries of God will be revealed. It happened for Paul. It happened for Peter. It happened for Elijah. It happened for Esther and Mordecai and Israel. And it's going to happen for you. The tumbler is there for a reason. And this world needs to know. You know, on my way somewhere yesterday, right at the same intersection that I saw that car, I don't know if remember I showed that picture, of the a car upside down. And I had a chance to pray with the people in the car same exact intersection yesterday morning driving and the accident just happened no first responders there yet bags you know exploded and everything and just you know going in there and, and just helping the uh when they finally came in this other guy helped the police officer with his thing open up the door and looking in there and seeing this This guy just, you know, really moaning, you know, him and his wife. And just saying, you know, 
start praying. Do you know God? Unfortunately, my Spanish wasn't what it should be, but I knew a couple of words. Dios te bendigos. Some of you are saying that's not how you say that. But I heard gracias. And I just kept saying, just pray. I was praying for them right there next to the car. You know, and then from there, I get a text about Paul in a car, you know, in the car accident on Thursday night. You know, this world needs to know Jesus. Paul did, praise God. But this world needs to know him. And if we don't realize there's a reason for why you are where you are, and it's to turn those tumbler pins, to, to turn that cylinder, to turn the tables on the enemy and open the door to God. You know what he's saying about you? It has to be you. It has to be you. If it's not you, then who? Who's in your situation to do something great for him? To know all the nuances of the relationships that you're in. You're the one. You're the one to turn the lock. It had to be you. I love the lyrics at the end of this. It just reminded me even though it's a secular song. For nobody else gave me a thrill. With all your faults, I love you still. It had to be you. Wonderful you, it had to be you. You can't mess his grace up. He has crafted you for the perfect door to open up the perfect cylinder, the perfect lock to go into. He has crafted you. You are his workmanship to unlock the mystery of his grace to everyone you know. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So as we finish out, Lord, we just thank you that you have a design. You have predestined us in your image. And every up and every down, every ridge and every notch of our life, Lord God, is designed for the perfect lock to unlock, as you, as you told Peter, so that your kingdom will come. And so, Lord, we love you. Man, we're just so unworthy of you, but you are so worthy. And in, in, in spite of all of our faults, you love us still and still choose to use us, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you want some prayer, please come up and pray with us. We love you guys. Amen.